chapter 9.42 uh, relating to the designation of the downtown exclusion zone within the city of McMinnville establishing boundaries, procedures, uh, charges and penalties therein and removing the sunset clause. Uh, Chief, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, I'll refer you to the staff report I've submitted. This is a uh, ordinance proposal amending um, McMinnville Municipal Code 9.42 as it relates to exclusion zones. Uh, specifically, um, back in 2016, August of, uh, we were in the wake of some problematic behaviors downtown. Um, uh, myself and uh, City Attorney Kosh, uh, work together to come up and he really did uh, a majority of the legwork on this with relations to uh, forming an exclusion zone that would be enforced through the court, through a court order, uh, through uh, the judgment of the municipal court judge. In essence, um, as your, the staff report says, uh, it was passed uh, in 2016 and part of that ordinance uh, uh, portion of the chapter uh, 9.42.060 uh, automatically meant it would sunset after three years. Well, on July 1 of this year, uh, this ordinance would sunset, meaning it would no longer be uh, on the books and enforceable. Um, I'm coming to you today to ask for uh, the city council's approval to amend the ordinance uh, related to uh, the exclusion zones to remove the sunset clause and keep this ordinance uh, on the books uh, for the duration. Um, there is no staff cost to this ordinance. I believe it has been a uh, shown itself to be an effective force enforcement tool for the McMinnville Police Department in the city. Uh, it's been able to protect, protect excuse me, uh, the congested commercial district downtown. I think from the staff report, you'll also note that um, our use of this, or excuse me, municipal court's use of this has reduced. Um, uh, I think your experience downtown has, has improved dramatically uh, since 2016. And, and uh, as, ca as a case in point in 2017, there were 12 exclusions through the municipal court, uh, five in 2018 and year to date today, uh, there's been one. Uh, exclusion. Again, um, staff has conferred with legal, uh, Mr. Kosh. Uh, he recommends that uh, uh, this n sunset clause go away all uh, altogether and that just be on the books. There was also uh, portions of this code which needed to be cleaned up and that's related to uh, the deletion of the term violation as a conviction of being able to be placed on municipal court probation. Violations are not crimes, which means they do not uh, go in, uh, the person uh, would not be placed on probation. So that's just a generally a, a housekeeping item. I'll let uh, City Attorney Kosh speak if he's uh, got anything he wants to add to this uh, statement. Staff does recommend that uh, City Council approve the amended uh, ordinance. Code. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and reread and inter introduce this ordinance. Uh, first reading with a possible second reading of ordinance number 5073. Uh, does any council object to having this ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, then I'll have uh, David read it by title only. Very good. This is a first reading of ordinance number 5073, an ordinance amending McMinnville Municipal Code Chapter 9.42 relating to the designation of the downtown exclusion zone within the city of McMinnville and removing the sunset clause. Thank you. Um, so uh, Matt made his presentation. Any questions at this point of uh, Chief Scales? Was there any discussion of an expansion of the exclusion zone um, from its original boundaries? No, we did not have. In, in fact, I don't think the, the downtown with other sorts of ordinances that are going to be in effect, I believe uh, the word, uh, specifically it's included in the uh, urban renewal area. Uh, we, we specifically, as I recall back in 2016, specifically kept this to a finite area uh, that included essentially the business areas downtown that were affected with the uh, problematic behaviors uh, that were affecting businesses, uh, livability and citizens experiences downtown. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. One question, Adam. Were you thinking about maybe expanding this to Alpine? Is that kind of... Well, mm, more expanding the borders of this and then looking at using it as an additional tool elsewhere. It, I mean, this was... I was on the board of the Downtown Association when this came about, and it was due to, a, as you mentioned, a, a, a boiling up of some issues, and, and the police department in the city had created this as a tool in your tool belt to, to help... Um, enforce codes and ordinances downtown. Um, so it seems that turned turned out to be effective, that it could be an additional tool in our tool belt elsewhere or in an expanded zone as problems and issues have grown and manifested in different ways and additional areas. So just wanted to have that discussion as well. Yeah, I, I would note, uh, separate and apart from this particular ordinance that dealt with the downtown exclusion area, we do have um, an exclusion um, policies related to our park system mm -hmm. um, for uh, bad behavior in the park system. We also have one for the parking garage. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have um, identified that in discrete areas that have um, specific issues uh, that, that need to be addressed and unique characteristics of those areas um, where um, essentially banishing uh, a member of the public from the public space is an appropriate punishment. Mm. Um, and so any particular, I'm not saying we couldn't expand that area, but any particular area we were looking to expand it to, we would need to have that kind of thoughtful discussion and dialogue about um, what what the characteristics were of that area, what behaviors we're trying to uh, address and, and exclude people from that. What constitutes a reasonable them. zone to exclude people? E exactly from. right. Yeah. Okay. I might add, Councillor Gary, that we were very thoughtful in, in this um, and keeping it to a really uh, particular area that was really affected with uh, the criminal behavior downtown and the ability to keep persons that were convicted out of that area for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Thus, at some point, if if we start seeing the behavior that we were seeing downtown, let's say in the urban renewal area, as we utilize Alpine more, it may be an opportunity to go back and address if we so need to. Certainly. Okay. I'd be happy to at that time. Adam? Uh, Chief, going back to the downtown safety task force days, um, the library and behavior over there bubbled up quite a bit there, and we had talked about how this doesn't really reach the library in those meetings. But I think the library is included in the parks. It is. So the library gets yeah. ganged up on that. It is uh, included in part of the park property, so. Heard about that from librarians. Through there. It falls within the park exclusion. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Questions? Hearing none, then um, I will um, ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5073 to a second reading. So moved. Second. And moved by Zach and seconded by Wendy. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Uh, signified by saying nay. And so uh, we will ask the city uh, attorney now to read ordinance by title only again. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5073, an ordinance amending McMinnville Municipal Code Chapter 9.42 relating to the designation of the downtown exclusion zone within the city of McMinnville and removing the sunset clause. Thank you, David. Um, I will ask for a motion to adopt ordinance uh, 5073. So moved. Second. It's been a move by uh, Adam and seconded by Sal. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Garvin. Aye. Councilor Geary. Aye. Councilor Peralta. Aye. Councilor Stassens. Aye. Ordinance number 5073 passes unanimously with a vote of four to zero. Thank you. All right, thank you. This takes us uh, now to um, okay. First, the first reading with a possible second reading of ordinance number 5065, ordinance 5069, and ordinance 5070. Uh, the next three items on the agenda. Uh, all relate to one development project, but are separate 
land use decisions. If no one objects, I would like to suggest that we consider the first reading of all three of them at the same time and then have staff present on all three of them uh, in one staff report. Does any councilor object to that approach? No, Mayor, but I do have a point of order. Okay. At what point do we need to declare ex parte communications in this process? Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and uh, um, ex parte. So it, uh, I'll, I'll just open it up to. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't script that because I didn't think that this was a public hearing process. <laughs> Deferring to you on that one. So would do if if we do a public hearing, it would be done, done at the public hearing. Yeah, it would be done at the public hearing. There is a there is a decision item that needs to be made tonight, um, and I would ask that when you get to that point in the in the process before taking a vote on whether to have a public hearing on this matter or move to a decision, that it, that would be the appropriate time to disclose those. Okay, will you flag that for the council, yes, yeah. David? Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Sal. Uh, so I'm back and uh, asking if we, any council objects to having ordinance uh, 5065, 5069, and 5070 read, read by title only. Hearing none, I'll have the city uh, uh, attorney read the first ordinance of 5065 by title only. So this is the first reading of ordinance number 5065, an ordinance amending plan development ordinance number 4722 to remove approximately 11 points, four seven acres from the boundary of the Oak Ridge planned development overlay district. And then I'll have uh, the city attorney read the first reading of ordinance number uh, 5069 <coughs> by title only. This is the first reading of ordinance number 5069 an ordinance amending the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development adopted by ordinance 4822 to add property to the boundary of the existing Oak Ridge Meadows plan development overlay district, allow for lot size averaging, allow for modified setbacks, allow for some lots with side lot lines orientated other than at right angles to the street upon which the lots face, allow for some lots to exceed the recommended lot depth to width ratio, allow some block lengths to exceed the recommended maximum block length standard, allow for the designation of an approximately 0.85 acre active private neighborhood, neighborhood park, and allow for dedication of an approximate 5.6 acre public open space greenway dedicated along Baker Creek. Thank you, David. And would the city attorney uh, do the first reading of ordinance number 5070 read by title only? This is a first reading of ordinance number 5070, an ordinance approving a tentative subdivision for a 108 lot phased single family detached residential development at R4417013000 slash R4407006002. Thank you, David. We will now call on our um, planning director, Heather, and associate planner, Jamie, to present to the council. Welcome you too. Yeah, so good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, we are bringing to you three different land use decisions that, uh, land use applications where the city needs to render a decision relative to one project. So that's why we thought it would be good to present them together, but they are three distinct land use decisions um, at, with different criteria in which we are making decisions. Uh, these are quasi-judicial land use proceedings. What that means is we are looking at these against our current code and regulations. Uh, it's not a legislative process, so we're not talking about uh, changes to the code at this point in time. In the state of Oregon, land use is highly regulated by both state law and local law as to what the process is to review land use applications to provide transparency for both the developer and the community. Uh, the community develops codes in, ter in terms of how they want to see development occur in their community, and then the developer's role is to develop to those codes. What we do is the planning staff is review the applications as they come in to make recommendations to you as to whether or not these, these projects are meeting the criteria of the code. It is your decision to, in the end, to render whether you approve or deny the projects and, and also approve or deny the findings associated with them. So 
in terms of process, it is, it is all, the process itself is also highly regulated. So the McMinnville Municipal Code has a section in it that talks about what happens after the Planning Commission makes a decision to recommend a land use decision to the City Council. Not all land use decisions will come to you, but these, all three of these are coming to you because we do have a section of the code that says the applicant can bundle their land use application, so bringing several at one time that are pertinent to one project. They then travel together, uh, and they travel together based on the, the, um, the land use application that, that has the most onerous process. So in this case, the plan development amendments, so you have two plan development amendments in front of you, and a tentative subdivision plan. The two plan development amendments are recommendations from the Planning Commission to you. You are the final decision-making body. The tentative subdivision plan, if it had come in on its own, would have been a final decision at the Planning Commission, but it's traveling with those two plan developments to you as well, and you are the final decision-making body on that too. When you receive the uh, recommendations from the Planning Commission, you can, based on the material in the record and the findings adopted by the Planning Commission, uh, adopt an ordinance affecting the proposed change, or you can call for a public hearing on the proposal, and then that public hearing is subject to the notice requirements also outlined in the code. So tonight, staff's gonna summarize the material that's in the record. Uh, we're gonna summarize the findings that was adopted by the commission and transmitted to you, and then you can decide if you wanna call for a public hearing. This, the staff report itself is also process, regulated by the McMinnville Municipal Code. There's been some um, community chatter about uh, staff making presentations to the Planning Commission and the City Council. That is also all spelled out in the McMinnville, McMinnville Municipal Code as to how we uh, process those through and bring them to you for staff reporting. So we also have to operate under regulations from the state. Uh, so there's an Oregon statute that says that cities need to render a decision in a timely manner. Um, and that timely manner is, with, is within 120 days unless the applicant requests an extension. In regards to this particular um, application, the applicant has requested an extension to August 13th, 2019 uh, to allow the public hearing process to occur at the planning commission level. That extends the process processing time to 201 days. So right now we're working on a deadline of August 13th, 2019. The reason that the statute exists is to ensure timeliness in terms of decision making so that um, development can't be prevented by a delay at the local level. Uh, we are suggesting to you that if you do decide to have a public hearing that you schedule that public hearing for July 23rd. We do have to notice it uh, per the code to surrounding property owners and we need to do that within a 20 to 30 day window. And then we also need to notice it in, in the newspaper. So the soonest time we could have a public hearing is on July 23rd. And we feel that after the July 23rd that would give you one more meeting in which to make a decision with a second reading of the ordinance if you choose to go in that direction. Uh, tonight's presentation itself, we're presenting three different land use applications. Um, they're all related to each other, but they do have different criteria, and we need to go through that for you. Typically, we allow for 20 to 25 minutes per land use application in our presentations. We do that so that we can describe the project and how we feel that it does or does not meet the decision-making criteria. However, tonight, we are prepa we're prepared to describe three different land use applications to you um, and how the Planning Commission felt it met, met the decision-making criteria, and then we also want to summarize the public testimony and public record for you as well. You've received all of that uh, four weeks ago, so you've had a chance to go through it, but it's a lot of material and we wanna be able to summarize it for you as well. So we are saying right up here in front that this, we anticipate this presentation to be about an hour and that's without questions. And then we expect to leave time for questions. We originally scheduled it on this agenda with the expectation that it would take about two hours to get through this process with you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie. He's gonna walk you through the projects and we'll sort of tag team this as we go. Good evening. <clears throat> so the, uh, the two plan development amendments uh, before you tonight, uh, 
relate to uh, to existing plan developments that have been approved uh, by city council in the past. The Oak Ridge plan development was approved in 2000 and the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development was approved in 2005. And uh, along with each of those uh, ordinances that uh, approved those plan developments uh, were development plans that were also approved, uh, meaning that uh, the plan development and the development plans are still on the books for for these properties and a uh, new subdivision could uh, be proposed for um, each of the properties separately uh, and if in compliance with the uh, plan developments that exist uh, today, uh, then those subdivisions would be approved. Oops. The existing plan developments are shown on the screen. Uh, the, on the left is the existing Oak Ridge phase four plan development uh, from 2004, that, which approved 30 lots uh, in the fourth phase. And on the right, the Oak Ridge Meadows uh, plan development from 2005, which had approved 99 lots on that property. <clears throat> Uh, so what is uh, existing today versus what is proposed in the uh, plan development amendments and subdivision before you tonight? Uh, the number of residential lots is decreased in the proposal. The preservation of primary wetlands on the site are found in both of the um, plan development and plan development amendments. Um, development impacting wetlands is found in both the existing and proposed uh, developments. The Baker Creek wet or riparian corridor and floodplain protection is uh, strengthened in the proposal uh, via the dedication of a public greenway. Open space and parks are found in the proposed development tonight and not in the existing plan developments. And there are strengthened environmental uh, protections in the proposed development and that aren't found in the existing plan development. I'll now walk you through uh, plan development amendment 3-18, which is uh, the amendment of the Oak Ridge plan development approved by ordinance 4722 in 2000, uh, originally uh, dealing with 30.2 acres. And the request uh, tonight is to remove 11.47 acres of undeveloped, unplatted property from that 30.2 uh, plan acre plan development. And the criteria for that are um, the plan development amendment criteria found in the, in the zoning ordinance. Uh, the outlined area in yellow is the area uh, proposed for removal from the plan development. <clears throat> plan development uh, 4-18 um, is the, the the amendment to the Oak Ridge plan development uh, originally approved by ordinance 4822 in 2005, uh, which planned the 24 acres uh, shown on the screen. And the request tonight is to add the 11.47 acres of property removed in PDA 318 to uh, this plan development and to request additional zoning departures and to require additional amenities. Uh, the request for subdivision 3-18 is to uh, master plan the 35.47 total acres of uh, the plan development amendments and to uh, propose a 108 lot single family residential subdivision uh, with public and private open space amenities. I'll describe a little bit about the site location and the context of the site. Uh, the site itself is north of Baker Creek Road, south of Baker Creek, um, <clears throat> uh, generally north of the existing Oak Ridge development. Uh, on the site, there are uh, floodplain um, located on the site as identified in the FEMA uh, flood insurance rate map uh, that was updated in 2010. And you can see uh, the site outlined in, in red overlaid on top of the, the FEMA firm panel. Um, <clears throat> The 1% annual chance floodplain or the 100 year floodplain is in blue and the 500 year floodplain or the 0.2% annual chance is shown in, in the light brown on the screen. 
Uh, outlined in orange here are the areas where the floodplain uh, does encroach on the property. And you can see that uh, the proposal uh, leaves development outside of those floodplain areas. Uh, the, the flood area zone um, is defined in uh, McMinnville Municipal Code, and that is determined by the 1% annual chance floodplain that is uh, defined by the FEMA flood insurance rate maps uh, dated March 2nd, 2010, and that is defined by the code. Development in that 1% annual chance floodplain is not allowed, and development in the 0.2% annual chance floodplain is not regulated by the code. Uh, the, the subject properties are east of undeveloped land owned by Stafford Land Company. Uh, that's the subject site of uh, Baker Creek North development that is um, looking at about 280 proposed dwelling units. It's north of currently developing land uh, for the Baker Creek East and West uh, subdivisions and developments. And there's approximately 270, 280 dwelling units there. And uh, just to note that the 2010 McMinnville Transportation System Plan does consider full build out of uh, land uh, based on the density allowed. And so the street network in this area is designed to accommodate traffic based on the full build out of these uh, developing and soon to be developed lands. <clears throat> There are wetlands found on the 11.47 acre parcel uh, north of the Oak Ridge development, which was, if you zoom in, that's this, um, this parcel here. There's 3.9 or 3.09 acres of wetlands. Uh, you can see uh, the dark gray shaded area is the delineated wetlands. Uh, 1.06 acres of wetland is anticipated to be impacted by the development, uh, leaving 2.03 acres untouched. And uh, the area of the wetlands uh, there in the blue shading is the um, contiguous wetlands that would remain and be protected in the development. I should point out that McMinnville does rely on state and federal agencies for wetland regulation. The Department of State Lands and the Army Corps of Engineer um, are the regulatory authority uh, for wetlands in, in McMinnville. <clears throat> Okay, I'll walk you through the specifics of Ordinance 5065, uh, Plan Development Amendment 3-18. Uh, currently, the site is zoned R2 uh, plan development. As we mentioned before, uh, Ordinance 4722 passed in 2000, zoned 30.2 acres of land R2 PD and approved uh, development of 107 lots. Uh, ultimately, some uh, minor PDA or plan development amendments uh, allocated those lots from three phases into four phases, and it's that fourth phase that remains undeveloped and unplatted that's the subject of the plan development amendment uh, here tonight. On the left is the original uh, development plan for the Oak Ridge development, and highlighted in red is the uh, an intersection uh, to Lower Pinehurst Drive uh, that you can see is within the 11.47 acre site, um, the subject site. On the right is the Oak Ridge Meadows uh, development plan and also highlighted in, in red is a intersection uh, that moved north when that uh, land became available to the developer uh, in response to uh, some unique geographical, geographic and environmental conditions on the site. It was better uh, location to move that north and develop those two properties concurrently. <clears throat> Um, however, uh, that was uh, in the Great uh, Recession and those properties did not develop at all. But uh, because of the development plan moving that intersection uh, north, uh, these two properties are um, tied together. Uh, you cannot develop one without developing the other. And yet they remain in separate uh, plan development um, zones. 
So the request for the uh, plan development 3-18 is to remove the 11.47 acres of undeveloped property. And the parcel would remain in the base R2 zone until it is <clears throat> rezoned. The review criteria are found in the zoning ordinance and the plan development amendment review criteria. And the staff report provided to you goes into um, more detail about the specific um, <clears throat> review criteria. But since this uh, plan development amendment is the removal of land and does not propose specific development associated with that removal of plan or removal of land, and that the removal of land does not um, does not uh, make the existing Oak Ridge development uh, out of compliance, um, that it does meet the, uh, the, the planning commission did find that uh, the plan development amendment 3-18 does meet the review criteria and they did vote nine to zero to recommend approval of the plan development amendment 3-18. <clears throat> Moving on to ordinance 5069, plan development amendment 4-18. Uh, now we're looking at the uh, 24 acre parcel uh, to the northwest of uh, the 11.47 acre parcel uh, that was originally part of the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development uh, approved by ordinance 4822 in 2005. Tonight's Plan development amendment request is to add the adjacent undeveloped 11.47 acre parcel for a total of 35.47 acres and it requests zoning departures and um, the addition of uh, public open space uh, and private open space amenities. The specific zoning departures requested are to adjust the average lot size to approximately 7,770 square feet, to amend setbacks, uh, specifically the side yard setbacks, uh, so that it would be a five foot side yard setback, uh, to allow side lot lines um, that may not be at right angles to the streets that they abut uh, to respond to some of the geography of the site to allow a maximum block length of 2,305 feet and a maximum of 800 feet between pedestrian ways, again, to respond to some of the unique geography of the site. <clears throat> uh, also requested is a maximum lot depth to width ratio of 2.75 to one, a minimum uh, 0.85 acre private active neighborhood park, a minimum 5.6 acre public greenway to be dedicated, and a requirement for wetland preservation and viewing areas. Uh, you'll see that if you look at the original Oak Ridge Meadows plan development from 2005, uh, that the approval did not include any open space amenities. And uh, because it is an active uh, plan development on the site, a similar subdivision could be proposed under these conditions um, and would be approved. <clears throat> so on the left is the Oak Ridge Meadows um, plan development, development plan. In the center is the proposed subdivision um, for your consideration tonight. And on the right, uh, highlighted in the green and the blue are open space amenities provided in the uh, by the plan development amendment 4-18 and the subdivision tonight. And those open space amenities are not found in the original plan development. Yeah, and just and just to add to that, the, the green that you see is primarily the floodplain. So there is a comprehensive plan policy uh, that McMinnville adopted, which looks at re uh, acquiring the floodplain through land division standards so that this it can be in public ownership. And that does two things. It protects the floodplain and it also provides an opportunity for a greenway um, park system along it with a, with a natural trail system, and that's in the park's master plan. Uh, and then there's a private park as well included in, in th this uh, proposal to be able to bring park amenities to bear for this neighborhood since the nearest park is across a minor arterial. And then the blue area you see there is the um, preserved wetland area. Uh, 
Uh, McMinnville Code does define purposes of a plan development, and there are a number of these um, <clears throat> that are considered when requesting um, zoning variances and, and deviation from from the standard regulations in order to approve a plan development. And uh, the staff report provided to you uh, does go into more detail about how the uh, requests do, do meet uh, the purposes of the plan development as outlined in, as outlined in the code. <clears throat> uh, the review criteria are the same for the plan development amendment 3-18, also outlined in code. And I will go through um, and briefly uh, describe how, how these are met. <clears throat> uh, the first review criteria are that there are special or physical, special physical conditions or objectives of a development which the proposal will satisfy to warrant the departure from the standard regulations. Uh, the unique uh, topographical and natural features of the site uh, are are special physical conditions that do uh, warrant some extra uh, thought and protection on the site. And the objective of bringing together these two large undeveloped parcels to master plan them in one uh, plan development is, um, is a special objective identified by the applicant. And also, as Heather did mention, that uh, providing the additional open space amenities to fulfill some of the master plan, uh, the park's master plan goals and comprehensive plan policies. Um, again, as another objective that meet this criteria. Uh, that the resulting development would, will not be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan objectives of the area. Uh, there are a number of comprehensive plan policies uh, appropriate to um, weigh this proposal by. And um, starting from natural resources dealing with land and water, housing and residential development, um, and how the uh, proposal responds to plan development and residential design. <clears throat> uh, the transportation chapter deals with streets, uh, traffic and pedestrian policies and um, community facilities dealing with parks, utilities, fire and police uh, protection and citizen involvement are all applicable to this, applicable to this uh, proposal and um, the decision document and staff report does go into more detail about how uh, the specifics of the proposal do meet uh, these planned or the comprehensive plan policies and goals. Another review criteria is that the development shall be designed so as to provide for adequate access and to provide efficient provision of services to adjoining parcels. Uh, specifically, uh, for this proposal, there is Pinehurst Drive, which is the road that wraps around the, the northern perimeter of the property. And to the southeast uh, does extend and dead end at the property line adjacent to land that is um, undeveloped uh, outside of city limits, but inside the urban growth boundary. And it is considered to be um, <clears throat> developable land and so providing access to that uh, is, is appropriate. Uh, the Southeast Extension of Pinehurst Drive also provides maintenance, maintenance access to an existing sewer service and sewer easement that runs through that adjacent property. Uh, the Southwest Extension of Pinehurst Drive uh, provides future access to the uh, Baker Creek North development uh, through the future extension of Shadden Drive to the north from Baker Creek Road and provides access to the temporary emergency access easement uh, proposed as part of the development. The fourth review criteria is that the plan can be completed within a reasonable time frame. And the applicant does indicate that the development would begin immediately following uh, approval of all permitting requirements. And the estimated phasing plan would be uh, first phase uh, completion in two years and phase two in the three following years after that for a five year uh, build out. <clears throat> 
The fifth review criteria is that the streets uh, proposed are adequate to support the anticipated traffic and that the development would not overload the streets outside the planned area. As we mentioned before, uh, the 2010 transportation system plan uh, does accommodate or take into account uh, the full development within the existing zoning. Um, <clears throat> and uh, traffic impact analysis provided by the applicant uh, anticipates the density of the proposed development um, would increase the average daily trips uh, along Pinot Noir Drive, which is uh, the initial access road into the development to its designed limit of 1,200 vehicle trips uh, per day. And uh, there is a condition of approval uh, proposed that does cap the number of dwelling units to 108 units until uh, the second access of Shadden Drive is developed. And that's to uh, keep that 1,200 vehicle trips per day uh, at that threshold. Additionally, there are improvements uh, that will be happening uh, very shortly this summer, I believe, uh, to Baker Creek Road uh, in front of um, in front of this development and the <clears throat> North development. The sixth review criteria is that the proposed utility and drainage facilities are adequate for uh, the type of development proposed, and there are adequate levels of utilities and drainage facilities to serve the site, including sanitary sewer, storm sewer, uh, drainage, municipal water, and power. And finally, that uh, air, noise, and water pollutants caused by the development do not have an adverse effect and uh, they're not expected to, uh, the residential development is not expected to generate air, noise, and water pollutants. And would also note that uh, 2.03 acres of wetland will be, would be preserved and protected and continue to provide ecological function and water quality functions in that site. So in summary, the Planning Commission found that uh, plan, development, plan Development Amendment 4-18 with the conditions uh, in the decision document did meet the review criteria and voted eight to one to recommend approval of the Plan Development Amendment with the conditions. So the sum total of the two plan development amendments is the tentative subdivision ordinance 5070 uh, S3-18. Uh, the request is to uh, develop the uh, amended Oak Ridge Meadows plan development amended as amended by PDA 4-18 to develop a 108 lot single family phased residential subdivision on the full 35.47 acres. Uh, on the screen is the tentative layout uh, or the subdivision layout uh, showing 108 lots, the average lot size of 7,770 and uh, the minimum lot size of approximately 5,000, a maximum lot size of approximately 14,000 square feet and 54 lots of less than 7,000 square feet. Again, uh, as part of uh, meeting the plan development uh, amendment and requirements of 4-18, the subdivision would provide a 0.5 acre private park, which is the uh, smaller shaded green area on the lower 11.47 acre. Uh, parcel, the 5.6 acre public greenway, which is the larger green around the northern perimeter of the of the subdivision, and then 2.03 acres of preserved wetland with viewing areas, which is indicated by the blue shaded area. <clears throat> the Review criteria uh, for the subdivision are in part established by the plan development amendment 4-18. And so you can see that um, the requirements of 4-18 would be met by uh, the proposed subdivision. And a condition uh, would be 
applied to um, bring the subdivision into compliance for the 800 foot maximum um, distance between uh, pedestrian bicycle ways. You can see in red are uh, the long uh, blocks created by the unique topographical uh, situation found on the site. And uh, in order to meet the 800 foot maximum uh, distance between uh, pedestrian ways to break up that long block length uh, on the north, a, an additional uh, pedestrian way would be required um, <clears throat> in somewhere in the proximity of that, uh, the dashed circle in the northwest uh, corner of the property. Other review criteria for the subdivision come from chapter 1753, the land division standards and approval of streets and ways. Uh, the streets in the subdivision are uh, laid out to respond to the unique topographic uh, conditions on the site, uh, such as the steep slopes and to um, provide access to lots uh, while keeping the road uh, at the edge and minimizing impact on, uh, on the existing wetland. Existing streets would be extended, uh, Pinot Noir Drive um, <clears throat> would be extended into the development. Uh, of note is um, the proposal to widen the existing terminus of Pinot Noir Drive, which currently uh, sits at 21 feet in width, which was um, built that way in response to uh, some existing trees that were on the site that are no longer there. Uh, so that street is proposed to be uh, widened uh, to current standards. Additionally, Pinehurst Drive uh, would be uh, built to provide the future access to parcels that we discussed earlier. Uh, again, other streets in the uh, in the development meet uh, current standards, and uh, pedestrian uh, sidewalks and park strips are provided along all the streets per city code. Easements and pedestrian ways uh, meet uh, review criteria found in in the approval of streets and ways section. And the pedestrian ways, as we noted, are um, met with uh, the condition to provide a 800 foot maximum distance between pedestrian ways to break up uh, some long block lengths. The lots uh, conform to the requirements of PDA 418 and uh, the size and the shapes of the lots are appropriate for the proposed use and respond to the topographic conditions of the site. Um, the lots generally are larger around the perimeter of the site where there are more environmentally sensitive uh, conditions such as uh, mature tree stands and um, uh, steeper slopes and so the larger lots around those particular conditions allow building envelopes to be kept away um, thereby allowing those um, trees and slopes to be um, left alone. <clears throat> So in summary, uh, Planning Commission found that subdivision, uh, tentative subdivision 3-18 with uh, the conditions did meet the review criteria and voted seven to two to recommend approval of the tentative subdivision with the conditions outlined in the decision document. So that, that's the um, review of the projects. We didn't go into much depth in terms of the findings and the, and the nuances of the projects in terms of how they meet the review criteria that was provided to you in the three separate decision documents uh, that all have findings of fact and conclusionary findings associated with them. We're happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation relative to that, but we wanted to be able to spend some time and share with you the public testimony that occurred at the Planning Commission 
commission level. You have the public record for that. We provide you with the full record of the written testimony that we received, and as well as the testimony that we received at the planning commission uh, during the public hearings. There were several PowerPoints made, and we tried to get through all those slides as well. And then we provide you minutes of the two different meetings that occurred there so that you have all that record as well. There was 51 written testimony submitted to the planning department for this project. Uh, from 29 different people or organizations. There were some that submitted several different types of written testimonies and provided oral testimony, testimony and then there were also some who provided just one or two. Um, we also had additional oral testimony at the public hearings and most of the testimony was oppositional. So some of the high level, we're not gonna go through every individual testimony that you received, you have that in your packet. We're gonna try and walk through sort of the high level discussions that took place at the public hearings and the planning commission and the, and the testimony that they received and talked to um, and walk you through what they were and the planning commission's findings relative to them. So there was a lot of testimony relative to traffic impact. There was concern that Pinot Noir Drive cannot handle the increased traffic that's proposed with the subdivision proposal. Uh, our, our adopted McMinnville Transportation System Plan did put together standards for our different street networks and for those standards the, there was an adoption as to what those streets would be designed to in terms of how many trips they could handle in terms of average daily trips. So that sort of set up the network and it's supposed to respond to the density of land that's going to be developed looking at the comp plan and what's what's um, plan for future development in all the lands within the city. So Pinot Noir Drive is a local residential street. Per our TSP, the standard is that it will handle 1,200 average daily trips um, on it. And based on a traffic impact analysis that was provided by the applicant, 108 dwelling units will bring it up to that 1,200 average daily trips. So we put a cap on the, we provided a condition what you do is you see if the development meets the review criteria, you can also condition the development to ensure that it's either can, can sort of step up to meet the review criteria or you can cap different things to ensure that it's meeting, that's within the threshold of what the standards are. We do have a recommended condition for you that caps the development at 108 dwelling units. We did that deliberately as dwelling units and not lots because we do allow accessory dwelling units in the city of McMinnville. And so we wanted to ensure that we were we're responding to actually the different household trips rather than the different lots associated with it. Uh, there was also develop, uh, testimony that development should be limited to the previous um, uh, to the previous limits in terms of that threshold, that cap of how many dwelling units could be built that were that was found in the existing plan development ordinance 4822, which was 76 lots. The 76 lots comes from two different places. It was, um, it was a number that was proposed as part of the annexation vote that occurred for that property come in uh, uh, to be annexed into the city back in, I think, the late 1990s. Um, and then it also comes from the planning process when it came through planning which was that uh, the development needed a secondary emergency access. So that's a, that's a fire and life safety issue to have a secondary emergency access and without it that there was a limitation on the trips. This is a plan that's coming to you today. Actually, the proposal today has a negotiated agreement with the neighboring property owner, Stafford Land Company, to have that secondary emergency access occur on their future proposed Shadden Drive right away. So they've negotiated with them that they will come in and build a gravel road that will accommodate fire and public safety um, equipment and will be able to access the development through that private property next to them prior to Shadden Drive being built. And so that removes the emergency, the need for the threshold of 76 trips based on that emergency access need. There was also testimony concerned about Pinehurst Drive and that it should not extend to the southeast to the Toth property. Uh, Les Toth did provide public testimony that he doesn't plan to develop that land, um, but the Toth property is currently outside the city limits, but inside the urban growth boundary and per our policies and codes, we do need to plan infrastructure with the expectation that it will eventually be built. And so that property actually has two other streets that dead end at it 
site, and this Pinehurst Drive would connect with those to accommodate development on that property in the future. There was, as Jamie explained, some testimony that was concerned about the northern terminus of Pinot Noir Drive only being 21 feet wide. There's a reason for that. It was trying to protect some mature trees. They no longer exist. The public right-of-way is there. It was dedicated originally with the build-out of that phase of the subdivision. And so the intent is to build that street to the local street standard, which is 28 feet wide. The testimony came in because there is a lot of material to unpack in this uh, development proposal with the three different land use um, applications. And I believe that many people didn't really realize that that was already planned for and proposed as part of the development proposal. There was a lot of testimony about the floodplain and the wetlands. Some of them combined the two, some of them were separate. We're gonna separate them for you and walk through that testimony. Um, the flood, there is floodplains as Jamie uh, showed you in this development proposal. Currently in the city of McMinnville, the way the floodplain is managed is we put it into a floodplain zone. So it's its own zone, just like we have residential zones and commercial zones. We have a floodplain zone on our zoning map and we have a floodplain zone code. And the code says that you can't develop in the floodplain. That's the way to manage it. Uh, to manage it. But the code also says that the floodplain is delineated by the, the firm panels, the FEMA firm panels that were updated in March 2nd, 2000. 2010, and there's no flexibility in that language as to what delineates that floodplain zone. So that land that's been set aside as the floodplain zone is per those firm map panels, and that's where we say you can't develop. Um, we have done that in such a way, So, and the, the code also has a policy, the comprehensive plan has a policy that the city adopted a, a, back when the 1999 parks master plan was adopted I said moving forward we want to have greenway parks and trails along our waterways um, and so as as land division comes in so subdivisions or planned developments we will ask for that to be dedicated to the city so that we can put it into the public park system and create these natural trail systems we haven't always done that as development has come in so we have lots of floodplain land that's actually in private ownership where we have have people building sheds and fences and things like that were in, which are impactful to the floodplain but probably don't realize that they're not permitted we are in code enforcement on them all the time um, and usually people don't realize they're not able to do that but if the floodplain it goes into the public entity's hands we're able to manage that ourselves the other thing happening on the floodplain where I think there was some misunderstanding is that uh, there was some concerns in public testimony about the riparian corridor associated with the Baker Creek itself and the flood by putting the floodplain into the public agency's hand into this greenway system with just an, an, a nature trail um, planned for it which is a bark trip trail bark chip trail um, of about eight to ten feet we're able to protect that riparian corridor by keeping it in public management so the riparian corridor is actually not going to be impacted by this development proposal. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind as we move forward with the discussion about the public testimony is um, we do have what we call the goal post rule in land use, which means that when a land use application comes in for review, it's reviewed under the code which was in existence when that application comes in. That's sort of the discussion of, uh, of how we started where we said this is a highly regulated process and it establishes the rules of the game for both the community and the developer. So the developer knows what rules that they need to develop to. The community has established the rules. We can't change those rules on the developer as we're looking looking at their project and it's going through a public process. That's the goalpost rule. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the floodplain itself and what that means in terms of a floodplain zone and development, but the goalpost rule was one of the discussions that was coming up at, this, at the Planning Commission relative to that. <clears throat> So um, the floodplain zone itself, it, it, as we said, we most of it's been put, all of it that's in the floodplain zone will be dedicated to the city as a public greenway project. And then the blue area you see on that map uh, that's colored it, uh, for the subdivision shows the wetland that will be preserved. 
Um, some of the testimony was that McMinnville is reliant on outdated FEMA maps and are in need of updating those maps and, and revising them. So Friends of Baker Creek, which is an organization that formed after the neighborhood meeting that the developer had um, to share with the neighborhood what this development project was, they submitted a hydraulic analysis, analysis before the second public hearing at the Planning Commission. And that analysis um, indicated that the Baker Creek watershed uh, was not well represented in terms of the what we call the flood hazard area mapping. So that's that what a lot of people think of as the 100 year floodplain, which is the 1% annual chance floodplain. So what that means is it doesn't mean a flood's gonna occur only once in 100 years. It means every year it has a 1% chance of occurring. Um, and that the, the hydraulic analysis also um, talked about uh, downstream flooding. So what does the build, up, build out of this development mean in terms of stream, uh, flooding downstream of the build out to other neighborhoods? So what we found through the analysis was, um, the result of it was that in terms of the downstream flooding, the peak flow increases by 0.2% and, and the downstream flooding will only increase by one one hundredth of a, of a feet. Yep. Yep. Um, and so th that in, in essence is fairly negligible and is, in, is, is not something that the hydraulic analysis showed as a concern so in terms of the downstream flooding. However, there was discussion in the analysis about the, that 100-year floodplain, that 1% annual chance, and, and whether or not the FEMA firm panels that have been adopted um, in March 2nd, 2010 are actually representative of what the actual floodplain is. Uh, the FEMA flood maps that were um, adopted in, in March of 2010 were done so after a three-year process of modernization of them. The, the, the process is a two-fold process. So what happened was uh, the engineering studies in terms of the hydraulic analysis were done in, in the 80s when the FEMA firm map panels were first put together. And then in between 2009, 2007 and 2009, city staff provided to FEMA and the Department of Land Conservation and Development, which are the two agencies that manage the FEMA firm map panel. So to, for the state of Oregon, it's managed by the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and then they work with FEMA as a partner and work with local cities. Um, so uh, City of McMinnville was one of the first uh, that went through a modernization process. They're trying to modernize all the firm, firm map panels through FEMA um, with Yam Hill County. We provided in your staff report what the overall game plan is for that in terms of the state of Oregon. You'll see that there are, are many communities with uh, far more outdated maps than our own. But the, the update itself didn't update the engineering analysis. What it did was it updated all of the development that's occurred. So we provided them as built as to what has occurred in the city of McMinnville so they could update that relative to, to the floodplain analysis. So the hydraulic report that was provided by Friends of P Baker Creek suggests that the floodplain could have expanded, that it's, that it's, that it's grown further than what's represented on those firm map panels. And it's impactful to five lots that are in the proposed development. So the hydraulic analysis took the proposed development and ran it through its models as developed and what would that look like? So in terms of what the hydraulic analysis provides, it's, the discussion is how do you mitigate risk and how do you mitigate risk within the goalpost rule? Those are the two things that we're working with. And so in, in terms of downstream flooding, the analysis doesn't demonstrate that there is concern relative to the development for downstream flooding. However, there may be some concern in terms of those five lots and the structure, structures built on them, so the homes built on those five lots, if there could be risk of flooding to those homes. And so one of the things, you, we cannot change that floodplain zone. So that's not part of this process. We're not doing a rezone of the floodplain zone. So we can't say it's in the floodplain, you can't develop those lots. Because by state law and federal law, you can actually build homes on floodplains. Um, you have to build them to a certain code and you have to get the first floor elevated off the, off the base floodplain elevation. And so there's different ways to do that. You can bring in permit, you can bring in fill to do that, or you can build the actual structure on stilts or a raised foundation, something of that nature. So there are codes that allow how these can be developed. 
Um, so one, and, and this sh sort of shows the what we're when we're talking about the floodplain. We provide this in the staff report. We're talking about two things. We're talking about the floodway, which is the the where the water travels, and then the floodplain, the floodway fringe, which is the where it would go over the banks during events. So the applicant, after the hydraulic analysis came into the city, the applicant came to the uh, Planning Commission public hearing. We got the hydraulic analysis a, a week before the Planning Commission public hearing and posted it to the record. The applicant proposed an alternative subdivision layout to accommodate possible expansion of the floodplain. So there's two ways they could respond. They could either build on the lots in such a way where they're elevating the homes above the base flood elevations, or they could not choose not to build on the lots. And what they did was transfer those five dwelling units to create 12, 10 dwelling units along Pinehurst Drive there on the southeast corridor. So they, they, are, they are retaining the 108 dwelling units that are in the proposed subdivision plan. They just put more density on the Pinehurst Drive area. Um, at the Planning Commission level, there was some discussion as to whether to move forward with that proposal from the applicant. Uh, we felt that there hadn't been enough time to review that or enough time for public to review that. And so we suggested that if that's a direction the city wants to go, that's a discussion to have at the city council level so that people have more time to digest what that means. We also had, um, we've been working with FEMA personnel, and we've been working with the floodplain manager at the Department of Land Conservation and Development since the Planning Commission public hearings to sort of walk through how do we, how do we navigate the potential risk in terms of the discussion. So the hydraulic analysis isn't definitive. It's, a, it's the analysis is written in such a way where it's a suggestion that the engineering for the, the floodplain maps that were adopted in 2010 were from the 1980s and things things could have changed. And based on some of the modeling they're doing that they did as part of the analysis, the suggestion is that they have changed. But they also have language in there that's clear that you know they don't feel the decisions for that need should be made based on that analysis. What they're suggesting is that more analysis needs to be done. Um, so one of the things we do with that is we, we do create conditions relative to that process. So with the West Hills, we had a geotech report that showed that the soils were, you know, circumspect. And so what we've done is for those lots that were in that area where the soils are circumspect, we have required every building permit that comes in for a home developed on those lots. So they go through another process of a geotech engineered analysis for that particular lot. So we can understand more before we allow the permitting to occur. So our recommendation to you this evening is if you want to move forward with a suggested condition of approval that sort of creates a lane for the city in terms of how to navigate this hydraulic analysis that's provided that's suggesting that the floodplain may have expanded, but we don't have definitive knowledge of that and we have the goal post rule in which we're working. That, the, um, that we have a process set up for those five lots that show impact. If the homes wanna be developed there, which affirms whether or not it's in this expanded floodplain and then allows for those homes to be built under the existing state and federal codes for how to build homes in a floodplain. And we have some language um, recommending that in when a city adopts a floodplain management program, it's really important as to how we navigate and manage that because that people's flood insurance is dependent upon it. And so we want to ensure that both FEMA and the Department of Land Conservation and Development are comfortable with our language and how we're approaching moving through these processes so we don't impact the overall city program in terms of those that flood insurance program and protecting that for everyone. Uh, we have applied for grants with FEMA to um, amend the floodplain maps, maps. We actually started working on that process about a year ago because, as you know, we're in a buildable lands inventory discussion. We're also looking at growth needs, um, and we need to do a natural hazards analysis. So we, we uh, went after a grant for that. We became a finalist for it, but we learned that we were turned down, that there were other um, jurisdictions and counties in the state of Oregon that showed more need than we did. And 
terms of that funding for the FEMA grants. We've also been in discussion with FEMA about how to update the maps in, in the city of McMinnville um, to do a comprehensive map update for all of our firm panels. It's about a five to 10 year program and you do queue and get into partnership with FEMA on how to get that work done or you can pay to do the work yourself and present it to them for review. And then you can also do individual letters of um, map revisions where you, for a particular project, you can go through a process and submit materials to FEMA where they will re review it project specific and site specific. That's a much quicker process. That's about a six to 12 month process depending on how complex that is. Uh, and then we had a lot of public testimony about the wetlands. Um, we had testimony uh, that you have in your record that suggests that the pros, proposed development impacts about 11.47 acres of wetlands. We do believe that that is something that may have been misunderstood at the beginning of this project and um, may, that the uh, phase four of the planned development uh, that's associated with 3-18 that's looking to be removed and put in the, the other one, um, that there was a confusion that that whole phase was a wetland. That's where the wetland exists, but it is only three, a little over three acres. Um, and so we think that there was some confusion as to the total amount of wetland acreage that was involved in this project. Um, but in the city of McMinnville, in terms of reviewing wetlands, historically, we have always deferred to the Department of State lands to review wetlands in terms of one, delineating them, so where are the wetlands? And then two, if, they, if development occurs that impacts them, how to mitigate that wetland impact? And so the Department of State Lands does that for, the, for most cities in the state of Oregon, and they have a process in which they do it. They review wetland delineation reports and say yay or nay. And then they also review removal fill permits based on development proposals and say yay or nay. They're going through a process of review based on the quality of the wetland, what's being mitigated, where that mitigation exists. Is it on the periphery? Is it the full wetland? Is you know those types of things. We don't have a wetland. And uh, management program at the city of McMinnville. We never have had one, um, and we have always deferred to the state agency for that. Every subdivision um, proposal that comes through or plan development, we have a condition of approval that says it must meet federal, state, and local regulations. We also have an additional approval that if there is suspected wetlands, that they need to go through this process to one, delineate them, and then two, to if they want to develop on them, to get the removal full permit approved by the state agency agency before we will issue any sort of permits for infrastructure development or housing development. Um, so that is a process we've had here. Um, there's been a lot of testimony that McMinnville should not allow any development that impacts wetlands. Um, we have done that. We've historically have many housing developments that have mitigated wetlands that have been permitted by DSL. We have a couple of them here for you just based on our knowledge and we've only been here a couple of years. We haven't done a scrub of all the plans that are at the city of McMinnville. We called the Department of State Lands, asked them for a database. Their, their question was, you want the whole database? So I was like, yes, I'd like the whole database if you have it. We don't have time to put that all together for you. To give you an example, we have three wetlands that are being mitigated right now for development in the city of McMinnville. The West Side Hills are being, there's a subdivision going there that's has some mitigation occurring uh, to support the housing development there. Our Hill Road Public Improvement Project had wetland mitigation associated with it. With that wetland mitigation, we did buy credits in the existing basin. There's a, so what happens when you do wetland mitigation, if you can't avoid the impact, um, and the Department of State Lands approves it uh, with the assumption that it's reasonable to for a development to move forward with that type of wetland mitigation. You have a choice of buying credits where you support uh, improving a wetland that's in the same basin or doing another type of improvement offsite. And so we have, there's a large wetland basin, ba there's a large wetland being improved in the existing basin that the McMinnville's watershed sheds in to, and so there are credits being bought to support that improvement that's occurring there. So our Hill Road project did that. We're currently in the process of reviewing uh, wetland mitigation for the old Sheridan Road 
improvement project. Howard Astor is underway doing that with some of his subdivision phases. And then we have a couple of subdivision phases that have occurred on this side of Baker Creek and also on the south side of Baker Creek Road that have wetland. If you drive through the community, you will see that there are roads nestled right up against really obvious wetlands and more than likely those roads mitigated the periphery of the wetland to, to be able to support the housing development. There was concern about tree preservation uh, uh, in terms of um, that some, at the beginning of the project, there was um, some rumors that uh, all the white oaks were going to be torn down along the riparian corridor. Um, and uh, with the change in the proposal that you see today versus what existed previously and is on the books, you will see that the difference, why there's less lots from 121 to 108 lots, is that there used to be a double line of lots along Baker Creek. And they were smaller lots, but what they did was they built right up against the, the Baker Creek watershed. So again, we weren't extract, we weren't exacting the floodplain for these greenways. So we were allowing development to occur. And what that would have done was the development would actually have taken down a lot of the trees. All there's a lot of tree stands along that the Baker Creek corridor. So the new proposal has longer lots. It doesn't have a double row, it has longer lots. That's where you have your 14,000 square foot lots. That's also where you have the difference in the lot to depth width ratio to allow for those longer lots so that it preserves those tree stands. Those will be in the backyards of those lots, preserves those tree stands and the slopes. So there aren't a lot of trees that are actually going to be removed. We do require, we have a condition of approval. We do it on all our subdivisions and our plan developments where we ask for an inventory of the trees that are nine inches or greater. We ask for which ones will be reviewed and why, I mean, which one will, will be removed and why they will be removed. Um, and then it, we, we review it and it's a decision of the planning department as to whether they can do that or not. And that happens before permits are issued as well. So we are, we are seeing those on all of our development, development prote projects right now. We do that to protect the mature trees on the site as much as we can. There are two um, mature oak trees that are beloved um, in that area. They're beautiful ones and both of them are uh, indicated to be on private property as part of this proposal. So we do also have a condition of approval uh, in the land use decision that does not allow the removal of those two larger oak trees that would be impacted by that. Oh, and lastly, um, in terms of tree preservation, you'll note that there's, um, there is a condition that allows flexibility for the planning director to adjust setbacks um, on some of the lots, and that's as as the lots start to get plotted, we wanted to make sure that we're able to protect those trees. So what we're finding is when someone does a tree inventory and they come into us, that they have to take down a tree that has a dimension of 15 inches or something like that that we want to preserve because the way that the setbacks were assigned, if it's right at the five feet, they can't put the house on the development and still protect that tree. So we want a little flexibility so we can move it a foot or so if we need to save that tree. Moving forward, I'm gonna recommend that we have that flexibility for other projects too as we start to get into some of these um, lands and sites where we have more complicated uh, natural features occurring in terms of development. There also, interestingly, we only had, I thought we would get more of this um, because of uh, what's occurring in McMinnville, but we had one person testify in opposition on the project because of the reduction in residential lots. So it does reduce the number of housing units that are, that are scheduled to come in with this housing development. It's the R2 zone. It's not... Um, meant to be a high density residential zone. It's R2, so R2 is our low density residential zone. The reason why it's R2 is because it is surrounded by the wetlands and the floodplains, and that's another means of the city protecting those, those natural features by not having the high density residential right adjacent to those, to those two types of features. And there are also, there's, there's been, 14, I gotta do the math in my head, 14, 15 years that have transpired since the original subdivision, um, since the original plan development was approved. And since that time, we've seen a lot more tree growth occur in terms of the maturity of the trees on, on the property. And so like I described before, we're trying to protect all those trees on the backside 
um, by Baker Creek, by having the larger lots there. So in terms of next steps, you have three ordinances in front of you. They each represent three independent quasi-judicial land use decisions. We do have a deadline in which to render a decision for these. Um, the Planning Commission conducted two nights of public hearing. At, at those two nights of public hearing, the applicant um, provided testimony that totaled about 90 minutes, 45 minutes on each night. They did a presentation and they did a rebuttal. And then the public testimony was about 163 minutes, 75 minutes on the first night and 88 minutes on the second night. Both, both public hearings limited the public testimony to three minutes each. Um, those, uh, ap the people that we knew who were interested in uh, testifying, um, we let, tried to let them know in advance that the limitation was three minutes each. That was a decision of the Planning Commission Chair. It was a decision of the Planning Commission Chair because of the amount of people that we thought would want to testify. So he wanted to be able to allow enough time for everyone to participate. So per the code, you have the decision in front of you is the planning commission's bringing to you their findings and we've tried to provide that to you in the written staff report and the oral staff report. Uh, you can consider the ordinances as presented or you can call for a public hearing on the proposal. That um, public hearing will need to be noticed per the code and I described to you some of the limitations we have in terms of timing for that. So if we do decide to do a public hearing, our recommendation is to, that it be date specific to July 23rd. 2019 and with that we will stand for questions thank you for the presentation uh, let's open up for questions and yes. before we do that I do want to run through the um, the few items here um, regarding conflict of interest bias and ex parte contact um, so I, I know you don't have the script so with your with your approval, um, I'll just ask if there's any member of the council that would like to declare a potential or actual conflict of interest with respect to the decisions that are before the council tonight. Does that include the ex parte contact? Not yet. Okay. Okay. So conflicts of interest would be any financial interest or uh, benefit or, or loss that might be incurred as a result of these. Okay. Um, anybody need to declare bias? Um, related to the decisions tonight. I uh, feel you can't objectively make your decision tonight on these matters, okay? And then the third is uh, the ex parte contacts. So this is where um, I would ask that you disclose any ex parte contacts that you've received prior to this evening um, and if those have been uh, submitted to staff so that they can be included in the, uh, in the public records related to this matter. So let's start with Adam and just work our way down. Uh, I received a phone call today um, by Rick Wiedner, um, more just encouraging urban infill than this subdivision particularly, but I felt that this subdivision uh, made that phone call happen, so I feel that I should disclose that. Outside of that, I got uh, an email from Sally Bowdle. Catherine Olson, Rick Thomas, Barbara Boyer, Carmen Mendenhall, and Eleanor uh, Kiltonson. Those will all be forwarded to you. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, Sal? So um, I, uh, <clears throat> maybe about a month ago, saw a notice posted on City Hall um, that talked about the subdivision. Um, I assume that the staff collected that notice and yeah so we that's already been entered okay. into the record um then every person that uh, adam just referenced getting an email from uh, i've also gotten emails from and then a couple of people in the community have mentioned the project in my presence um steve bagwell kayla visay uh and sandy colvin the um conversations did not go very far in any of those so I wouldn't characterize those as in-depth conversations in any stretch. Thank you, Sal. <clears throat> Let's move down to Zach, and then we'll move this way. Uh, I got the same phone call from Mr. Wiedner as Mr. Garvin did, and, and conversation didn't go far. Um, and then I got the same emails as everybody, or as, as Adam mentioned, uh, Eleanor Kittleson, Steve Bindle, Miss Boyer. So I think those have all those. Wendy. 
Um, I uh, received the same emails. I actually chose just not to open them and read them, so um, just because of ex parte contact. So, but I received them. So, if you want me to forward them, I can as well. Please do forward them to planning staff. Thank you. And I've received the same emails. I opened probably the first three, and I used the language that you'd sent out, and then I forwarded those on to Heather and on, on to you. Uh, the rest of them I have not opened. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank you. So that leads us to an opportunity. If you have questions of uh, Heather or Jamie, this would be the time to do that. So I'll just open that up. <coughs> Any questions you've come with? Sal? Heather, um, page 14 of the packet um, references um, Department of State Lands, um, and it says a 1999 wetlands mitigation failed. Um, that was their only comment, and that if there were additional um, work done on that, that that they would have to resubmit that application. Can you elaborate on that for me? <clears throat> sure. Um, as part of the original approval of the plan development, um, work began to establish the infrastructure to create um, the lots for the fourth phase of um, the Oak Ridge um, development. And uh, as part of that process, it went through the Department of State Lands permitting process for development that impacted the wetlands. Uh, for Pinehurst Drive in particular, I believe, uh, did impact the wetlands and uh, mitigation of the impacted wetlands was required on site. And so a portion of the wetlands that you see on the screen there, uh, shaded in the blue, are um, mit mitigated wetlands from the earlier um, process. And not all of the wetland uh, mitigation took because of um, uh, various conditions on, on the site. And so as a result, I believe that uh, mitigation is being recommended uh, if mitigation were to be approved and required for uh, wetland impact on the site that it would be uh, recommended to be offsite in the mitigation bank. Um, that that process that Heather described. So the uh, the failed wetland mitigation was from the the earlier um, uh, impact from development. So they they applied for a removal fill permit to move forward with the development project. It was approved, and they went forward with implementing it. They didn't implement it all the way, from our understanding, because of what happened with the Great Recession. They chose not to move forward, and, and then that mitigation failed. So, so, but then the their your summary of what they submitted continues, and it says. Because of the number of years and changes to the landscape since the delineation, the department would require a new delineation to review before an application is submitted. So how does that affect this process? Yeah, so it does affect this process. So we required them to do a delineation report again uh, when they came in for this amendment. That's, what's still, that's what you see in terms of the gray uh, shaded areas. They have submitted that to the Department of State Lands. Uh, for review, and then um, that will need to be approved by the Department of State Lands. Then they will then also submit their um, application for the removal fill permit to the D Division of State Lands, I apologize, and then that will need to be approved before we issue any permits. Okay, and then given that the mitigation, the previous mitigation didn't take, I think that was your mm -hmm. phrasing, mm -hmm. does that implicate any part of, of the attempt to mitigate on the existing project. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so what it will, is, again, we're not the experts in wetland mitigation, and that's very deliberate. deliberate. Um, we are relying on the Division of State Lands. Our anticipation, as well as the engineers who have been working on this, is because the wetland mitigation didn't take from the first removal fill permit, that the, what will, the wetland mitigation that will be applied for and will be reviewed is, is the mitigation bank, which is a financial investment in improving another wetland in the watershed. Okay. 
So it's basically trading mm -hmm. this for a different spot. Yeah, and that's, that is one of the remedies that's allowed by the Division of State Lands. Okay. I have a, I can, I have a couple of other questions related to the application, but not rel related to that specific portion. Okay, sorry. Did you guys get the gist of that last exchange? Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so the other questions that I had relate to the uh, traffic flow. Um, in the development. So we have policies 77 and 78, and 77 basically says promote a safe and efficient traffic flow, and policy 78 says traffic systems within the proposed development shall be designed to be compatible with the circulation patterns of adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. And it seems like your analysis is that because the streets were designed to a 1,200 capacity that that 1,200 capacity doesn't change the circulation patterns of the adjacent property. Is that right. a fair characterization? Uh -huh. Yeah. So the the network is designed uh, in terms of all the excuse me in terms of all the different street classifications to work with each other. Uh, the local residential streets are you know picking up traffic and pushing it out to the collectors and arterials, and so they're designed to pick up different types of traffic volumes. Um, so per those two policies, the city has a standard that says an adopted standard that says says development can occur and it can occur to a point where it's generating this many average daily trips on the local residential street and that's the 1200 average daily trips. Um, well, that seems to be 77, right? That's the safe and efficient right, traffic right. flow. So the, the connectivity in terms of the network, creating the network, that's the discussion of we do require all subdivisions and planned developments when they come in to show how their street network is going to connect to establish, uh, uh, to continue the network into other lands adjacent to it for connectivity. That's the whole discussion of Pinehurst connecting to Shadden Drive as it comes through the Baker Creek North discussion and also the left. Toth property, which now, if this is approved, would have three streets coming into it that will connect with each other to create the, the network for that land to develop. If we didn't do that type of connectivity, we wouldn't have a network that we could work with, and that's what 78 is getting to. And, and so the initial Baker Creek subdivision where the Toth property is, you're saying that that was initially intended to be connecting to this mm -hmm. division? Yeah, so if you look at, we don't, I don't, do we have that in our ghost slide? Um, if we could pull up, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's so much in this that we didn't know how much to bring to, but if we pulled up the Toth property, you will see there are two other tr streets today based on developments that occurred south and east of the Toth property that have streets that dead end right at the Toth property. So they come up like this. Mm -hmm. And that's that's with the purpose that they will eventually connect to the street network so that that Toth property can be developed. Mm -hmm. um, one other question related to the street traffic flow and the safety mitigation. So basically the short-term safety mitigation is you're gonna, uh, they want to construct a dirt gravel road for the fire truck to go through on Shadden. Yeah, so f fire needs to, f for public safety, there needs to be two accesses to the neighborhood that a fire truck can access in case one of them is blocked for what, an, the event blocks it, so the fire or the unnatural event or traffic blocks it. They need a way to get in. Isn't, isn't that a good idea just in general for safety of the public? meaning two access points to a rather than one to a subdivision. Do we have any subdivisions right now where there's only one way in and one way out? There is. Uh, right across the street on Baker Creek, uh, on Baker Creek Drive, I believe, is it? Oh, the private, Doral, the private road. Yeah, the private road. Uh, Doral. Claim four, four. Yes. Yeah, okay. That, that's a one way in or okay. one, one street access. So we don't, we don't have a policy. Part of, part of it is the um, discussion of the rules that the communities developed in which development will occur, right? So we don't have a policy that requires two access points into a neighborhood to serve the neighborhood if the, if the street network can serve it. Our policy is, does the street network serve the neighborhood? And this is 
what the street net network will carry in terms of trips. If the city wants to move forward with an, a policy based on we need to have this many access points into a neighborhood that's developed so that we can disperse traffic, that would be something we discuss and do in a legislative process. And that's establishing a new rule for future development. But right. we don't have that today. So we don't have the nexus in which to require that. Except that I'm, I'm trying to interpret this policy 78, which I see as, as being a little different than, I mean, at least in my interpretation of it, which is that the development should be compatible with the circulation patterns of adjacent properties. I understand that, that a road may have the potential to have more capacity, but the fact that you have a neighborhood with an existing character and you're talking about, you know, we're talking about basically increasing that traffic sixfold. Um, I don't think that would happen if we had a second access point at Shab, and that's not what their traffic analysis said. So my, my other question is why the dirt road on Shadden, why can't we have that road developed as a public street? Uh, well, for two reasons. So um, the, the first question I would have is if the concern is the amount of traffic that Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir Drive is going to carry in terms of average daily trips as a local residential street, if we create a finding that says that's too much traffic for that road, that what we do is we move forward with that precedent and we're saying that our local residential streets as designed cannot accommodate 1,200 average daily trips. We'll use that same finding moving forward because we've just, we've just set the new rule right and so that's that's the discussion if that's the discussion we have we just need to be I'm not saying that that's right or wrong the 1200 average daily trips I'm yeah. just saying if if we move if the, if we move the goal post we move it for all development um, so that's the first part of it if the concern is that, that Pinot Noir is going to have too much traffic on it then then we need to look at the standards for our local residential streets if the concern is that we need two access points for all of our neighborhoods then that's also a new policy and we'll move that forward we don't have the nexus to tell the developer you need Need to build a road to local street standards on another person's private property that you don't own to be able to build your development. So, so your opinion is that 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 the, the policy 78 does not create a nexus um, by significantly changing the, the traffic patterns and the character of yeah. the of based the, on that. based on the way that the city has developed findings and the precedent set for that comprehensive plan policy has never been interpreted in that way as a city council you always have the opportunity to interpret your code and create a finding with that interpretation but the the basis for that is you've now just said this is how this code will be interpreted and it's not project specific it's not just Oak Ridge Meadows will move forward with this interpretation it is all new development will move forward with this interpretation. Well, except that I, I disagree that what I'm saying is that 1,200 cars on a road is on a road of this width, et cetera, is never okay. What I'm saying is this affects a specific neighborhood in a certain way that changes the character of the neighborhood. But we have lots of neighborhoods that that are adjacent to undeveloped lands that have streets going through them that are that are planned to have more trips on them when the other when the other lands associated with those streets will develop. Mm -hmm. This seems to have a, okay, well, I don't want to get into it. Yeah, further. But I'm, I'm saying you, you can, I mean, legally, you, you as a city council have the opportunity to develop your findings and interpret your code. What I'm just cautioning you as when you, when you put it together, it's a legal basis. It's setting up a precedent and it has, it, it is then applied to all future developments with those same conditions. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm done with my questions. I just have one other comment, which is that the other policy that we have that I'd like to rec rec um, recognize is policy 188.00, which is to provide an opportunity for citizen involvement in all phases, all phases of the planning process. So either, even though the planning department took a lot of testimony on this, I'm going to be in favor of of a public hearing on it. So, and I, with that, I'm done. Thank and that will be a question that we'll have coming up as soon as, as we clarify questions. So, Adam, you had Heather. What's the current uh, daily trips that we estimate are on? Pino Noir Drive. Uh, it was it was approximately 200 for the um, the northernmost section. And what um, I guess my main concern about that many 
additional daily trips, and I understand the precedent that it could set is I've been back in that neighborhood and how long it takes cars to queue up and turn left and get onto Baker Creek Road. And if we go six-fold with the traffic for how people are going to commute into town, do you or is a transportation plan, which I'm guessing it is, is it laid out to say that Baker Creek Road and the intersection of Baker Creek and Westside and the intersection of Baker Creek and 99W, we're not going to have traffic queued up like we used to on West 2nd or like we do on Old Sheridan Road currently? Heather, maybe Mike's still here. Yeah, and so it's, Mike can come up and, and He may be a better one to address some of those questions about the transportation impacts. But um, if I understand you correctly, the concern is the dispersion of trips as they come out onto Baker Creek Road from, from Pinot Noir, right? Yeah. Um, so the transportation system plan is developed in such a way where incrementally the network is being improved as development occurs. So, so the transportation system plan adopts a, a system of different types of street classifications based on full build out. And then those street classifications are built to their full mm classification as the development occurs around them. So for instance, with Baker Creek Road, it's intended to be a three lane street with a with a dedicated turning lane in the middle, a center lane. Um, that's not there currently. However, as development has been occurring along Baker Creek Road, especially in this section with the Baker Creek east and west subdivisions that are south that Stafford's been building out and now with this discussion of Oak Ridge Meadows, the city's coming in this summer and, and there's enough asphalt on Baker Creek Road to create this third lane. The city's coming in this summer to repaint it to create that. That should create a refuge in terms of left turning movements. Thank you. I don't know if Mike wants to add anything to that. The only uh, context I'd add in addition to that is it's a foundational element of our transportation plan that our corridors will become busier as we grow. Um, and we set a level of service standards for those facilities um, that um, uh, developers must demonstrate that their development will uh, satisfy those level of service standards. And so there is evidence uh, submitted by the developer uh, in the record that indicates that at the full development of their uh, proposal, those intersections will meet the level of service standards the city has adopted for Baker Creek Road. So, but it is a foundational element of our transportation plan that our city's roads will be busier as we develop and we don't have the ability to build our way out of congestion. Thank you. Uh, with that, I guess we're going to comment later on public hearing. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, if I, if I could, I, one thing I just, I, I, I posed this question for consideration um, by uh, Councilors Feralta and Garvin is um, it, at what level, just to be thinking about this, if you're thinking about conditions that are going to impact this number of trips, is, is what is the acceptable level of additional traffic before you would require that second access? Is it one additional dwelling in that subdivision? Is it 40 or is it 107? Um, what, what is that level? Because that's, that's what we have to, to base that on, unless if it's, if it's even just one single dwelling needs that secondary access, then we just need to be able to state that in, in the basis for that. So I, that's why I pose that question so you can be considering it. Thank you. I'll look to my right and any questions, uh, Zach or Wendy? Um, okay, thank you guys for the really thorough report. It's it's excellent, very informative and well organized. Thank you for all your work on that. Um, I had a question about the 108 lot max. So um, I, I just needed to, wanted to understand how that will play out in practice with regards to like, say you did have an ADU that came in, mm -hmm. do you just wait until the end and say, okay, you can't develop that last lot or how does that play out in practice and how does it get triggered? Yeah, so, so it's 108 dwelling units and not 108 lots. And that's very deliberate for, for the reason that each household is generating a certain amount of trips. That's the science behind the average daily trips and trying to create that threshold. Um, 
it will get tricky, especially with ADU. So one of the things that uh, legal advice provided to us is that it hasn't, uh, last year the state legislature passed some state law about accessory dwelling units and that all cities need to allow accessory dwell dwelling units on all single family residential lots. Mm -hmm. There was language in that state legislation that also exempted it from some of the land use requirements in terms of assigning it as a dwelling unit value. Value. So how that plays in terms of generating traffic impact, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, we're going to interpret it that it's a dwelling unit, unit moving forward until that's tested. The other thing that's going to come into play, which may be interesting in terms of how this all plays out, is House Bill 2001. So if House Bill 2001 gets adopted, any single family residential lot in the city of McMinnville can be developed up to four units. You can put quadplexes on them. and, and that that's a mandate by state law. And so those four families are generating four dwelling units worth of trips. And so we want to ensure in terms of the traffic impact that we are mitigating it relative to how many families are generating trips rather than how many lots we have, because we're not sure how many units are going to be on each lot. There's a lot of moving pieces out there. So we will keep a calculation uh, on the permitting process. As, as things come in for building permits, we're reviewing them. So for instance, with Baker Creek West right now, there's architectural review on that. So we're reviewing every single one. We keep a master map and we're calculating as we go. And that's, that's how we manage the thresholds. And so if, it, if they get to the 80 before they're done building out lots, they won't be able to build, or whoever won't be able to build more out there until a second access road is mm -hmm. Okay, great. And that's, that's how the condition of approval is written. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I have a couple of questions about wetlands also. So I do understand that um, we don't have a local, I mean, the mechanism for establishing what happens with regards to development on wetlands is with the state. And so we really don't have a local mechanism for determining how that happens. Mm -hmm. You said most municipalities have that, They, but most of them defer to the state. Can you just... Um, do you know of any municipalities that do have local control and what is yeah, that? Yeah, so the larger ones do, the larger cities do. Um, I think Salem has one. I, when I was speaking with Mike de Blasi is our local representative from the Division of State Lands and I asked him uh, what what communities the size of McMinnville have their own uh, wetland you know, inventory. We don't have a local wetland inventory. We've never identified them locally. Um, so we don't have a master map outside of the state and national wetland inventory. And that's why we rely on if there's a suspected wetland, you need to get a wetland delineation report done and approved by the state so we can understand whether one exists or not. Um, and then we don't we don't manage it. We don't have any engineers on staff or planners that are experienced in terms of understanding, you know, what the hydrology analysis is, the impact to the wetland if removal or fill is brought in, and how to sort of manage that. Um, he did tell me the city of Monmouth is the only city he's aware of that has their own local wetland inventory program. I haven't talked to them to find out why and how it's being managed. We honestly haven't had the time to do that. I suspect after this process, this process at the planning commission level was, um, it was, it was a tough one. It was a tough process, and there, there's a lot of emotion behind this project in terms of for and against, uh, and that emotion was very clear uh, during the public hearing process. And so the Planning Commission wants to have a lot of dialogues about whether or not that's something we want to bring in locally or not, and what do we need to do with the floodplain maps. So that's the legislative piece of what's working, what's not working, and if we feel something's not working, how do we you know, move mm -hmm. forward and analyze it? I suspect we'll have those discussions and sort of do the evaluation and see if it makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you with our current FTEs for planning relative to uh, population, we're below the norm as it is, and I don't know how we would bring on a program like that and manage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wondered that too. There's also been discussion of, we have some testimony that says, you know, don't develop in wetlands at all. That would be a policy. So if we created a finding saying we don't want to allow development in our wetlands, that's that's a policy moving forward. And we can move that forward, but then, then we're, you know, we are reorganizing and reanalyzing all of our buildable lands inventory. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, that answers my question. I wondered if what you, I guess this might be an additional question, if you, and you might not have enough information at this point, mm -hmm. but if you saw pros and cons, I mean, obviously one of the cons that we're hearing now is that there's frustration in our communities that we don't have more control over that, right? Because we don't really have a mechanism for us deciding as a community what happens with the wetlands and development. Um, but uh, a pro is that we don't have enough, the capacity to, at this point, the FTEs well, to be. I guess, I guess there are two different things. So the, to me, the policy question is, do you allow wetlands to be mitigated for development or not? Mm -hmm. So in McMinnville, it's been allowed. That's That's been a policy decision and it's moved forward and there's lots of examples of it. And if it is allowed, who decides how much and where and what are the standards and how to weigh that and how to analyze that. And that's where it's deferred to the state level where the expertise lies. So I guess I would say if, if, if the issue is we don't feel like we have local control or the issue is we don't think wetlands should be developed at all, that's a policy you can make at the city level. We can make that policy and moving forward, not develop any wetlands. Even with the state, yeah. even if we manage uh -huh. it with the so state. So what it would mean is every developer would have to do a wetland delineation report and you can't mitigate wetlands for development. Um, there's also been requests to buffer the wetlands. So not only can you not mitigate the wetlands, but there there was some public testimony saying, let's take the whole 11 and a half acres out of development so that we can buffer the wetlands and protect them. Well, we can do that. We can have a policy that says we want to buffer wetlands as well. We can, those are decisions that can be made at the local level. But it's impactful to do, you know all these other pieces. And I would suggest that as we have those discussions, we then evaluate, you know, if you push on this lever, what other levers are it pushing in terms of the overall scheme and game plan? And, and that's analysis we can do. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should make the comment at this point, just as planning uh, commission passed, that that would ha be going forward, not for this quasi-judicial. Right, right. That's all goal. legislative work. That's mm -hmm. that's the discussion of the community saying we are we want to change the rules for development. Right. Okay. Um, I have a couple more, but they're still percolating, so I'll let that go. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to go at them. They're a little scattershot, but they're all questions. I can guarantee you that. Uh, am I reading this right, that the wetland viewing area with bench is also the fire truck turnaround? Correct. Okay. I was reading it right. Um, uh, what are the designations of all the streets? But it's uh, just just for everyone in the audience, because that sounded a little awkward. The wetland viewing area with the bench is separated. It's not in the same turner, turning movement as the fire truck turning <laughs> access. It did sound odd. So it is or is not the same space? It's, it's in the same area, but the, it's, it's not in the same turning movements as the fire truck. Right, so you create a big flat gravel spot that hammerheads and meets all that requirement, yeah, yeah. and it doubles we, as a we place. We would not put people on a bench in an unsafe <laughs> situation so that they can view the a wetland. <laughs> They're going to be on the edge of the bench. Yeah. Okay. Bench, no one's not taking up. bench adjacent. Uh, <laughs> what is the designation? What are the types of streets that occur in the... So, so what uh, collectors or locals? They're all locals. They're all locals. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would be pursuant to the R2 zoning. But they're all. Yeah. So 7106. Yeah. Um, and then I see the labeled as a bike path. Is the only one I saw is in the park. Are there other designated bike paths outside of the park? Uh, I see. Outside I see. from aside from sidewalks, no. The the path through the park is intended to be a multi-use multi-use trail. And so, as far as official designated bike movement zones. So, so the, the real term. Yeah, the nature trail that's in the greenway. The, the bark chip path. Yeah, that's meant to be a multi-use pedestrian bike path. Multi-use pedestrian bike path. Yeah, two-use. Park chip. On it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you. Uh, what are, so would this, they would give that area to the city, the wetland area, give that to the city designated for parks, which I think is awesome. Love to get the entire waterway connected for all of us to move along freely. Um, do we pay for that park chip and development of that, or would that be part of this? They would develop that and then give it to us. So one of one of the conditions of approval that's in the land use decisions is that they would dedicate that land to the city, so give it to the city. They would also construct the amenity, so the the park chip trail, and then they would hold it and maintain it until 2032. Excellent. Um, and we are proposing this a similar type of system for the Baker Creek North project that would connect with this. Cool. Um, do, 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 do the, so the planned, uh, the development or uh, policies have sort of their, or plan development have their own little set of policies, and then they refer to plan developments shall blah, 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 plan developments shall blah. Then are those, um, and I can use a refresher, the, are those policies that prove that only are related to the development itself, or are they related to the development in terms of the rest of the city of McMinnville? So when it says it will encourage a mix of this, that, and the other, is it a mix of this, that, and the other in this plan development only, or in relation to all the other city, all the other developments in the so city? That, that review is for this plan development. Those so. Points. So things like ensure a variety and mix of housing types and prices, that means that we're sure that this plan of element is going to ensure a high type, high, high uh, mix, thank you, of housing types and prices. Yeah, so the, the discussion there was, and, and uh, uh, when the proposal first came in, we got back to the applicant and said, um, we need to understand better. So the burden of proof for the findings of whether the proposal meets the criteria or not is on the applicant, and then we review it to see if uh, we agree or not and make that recommendation to the Planning Commission, and they take a vote on whether they agree or not. And um, so with the variety of housing types, we had that discussion with them. Um, the the finding there is that there's a rather than having an R2 subdivision where you have all lots of a similar size, there's, there's a variety of, of house lots in here. So the R2 has a minimum lot size of 7,000 square feet. The PD actually has an average lot size of 7,700 and something square feet. And the reason for that is because it allows for a variety of lot sizes. You'll see on the whole interior part of this inside uh, Pinehurst Drive, those are small smaller lots going down to 4,900 square feet. And so that, that variety of lot sizes is gonna ge generate a variety of different home prices. We talked about different types of housing types as well and how to bring those online into this um, neighborhood too. So we, we asked for things like duplexes and townhomes and things of that nature. However, because of the topography of the site, there's, there's a couple of, and the reason why there's a um, variance in terms of the squared off intersections is there's there's topography issues on this site. So be able to, to f be able to bring in access into these different types of housing types proved to be problematic. And price. What's that? Did you get to you talked about the first two? Did you get to price? A variety mixing. Types and prices shall be encouraged. Yeah, the price is, is the lot. So your 14,000 square foot lot versus. You're just tying that to a direct 50. correlation of price to size? Yeah. Okay. Um, was there much discussion on the plan development policy 72 about the. Uh, actually, not. That's an ill formed question. I think that's the end of my questions. Yep. Thank you, Zach. Wendy, did you have a few more? Um, yeah, I had a question about the supplemental findings provided by the applicant. Um, I just, it's this is more of a process question. They wrote it as if it was, you know, for us to incorporate straight into the findings. Um, but at what point um, does, do you guys tell us your thoughts on, because usually on the findings, on the regular findings, you guys had agree or additional or whatever. Um, do you, is there any feedback from you guys about your thoughts about their rebuttal or their rebuttal? I'll start and then, def and then defer to David. <laughs> so um, wording, but we, we had a lot of discussion funding. about this. The, the code's very clear that what we bring to you as the city council is what the planning commission voted on in terms of their findings. Mm -hmm. 
Um, however, from what I understand it, there's also case law and other things that are, are in play here, and so David can talk a little bit about that. So that's why it's presented to you the way it is. We presented the decision document that the Planning Commission voted on and recommended to you. So that's their findings of fact and their conclusionary findings, and then presented the supplemental findings as part of the record. So. <laughs> So the supplemental findings um, as stated in my cover memo are not intended to provide any new um, evidence, uh, testimony or argument. Um, they're simply intended to address matters that had previously provide findings to address um, those matters that were raised um, after the original findings document was prepared and submitted, but prior to the planning commission's decision. So there's a period of time from the time that the findings document was put into the packet and submitted to the planning commission. Um, that, that's one point in time. And then after that, you've got additional written testimony that comes in. You have the public hearing that occurs. You have all of the testimony that's submitted and documents that are submitted as part of that process. And then you ultimately have the decision uh, that's made. Um, and it is um, not uncommon practice um, and, and has been is a process that is authorized under court interpretations related to land use statutes that the applicant has an opportunity to prepare findings, draft findings for consideration by the decision-making body that addresses issues. So um, in this particular case, uh, because of the way in the, the timing of the, the preparation of these supplemental findings and needing to get them to you, um, staff did not judge that there was an adequate time to fully go through them and vet them and make recommendations based on them. So purpose of my cover memo was to present them to you and give you the option of either um, uh, adopting them or not adopting them or amending them prior to adopting some version of them to go along with the other findings. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting because it's like all of the other testimony becomes part of the record, but this one in particular becomes findings that are actually adopted as if the city council is saying, I mean, because the city council would be saying if we adopted all these, like, yes, we agree with everything you say in here. That, that's right. And so if you if you don't, um, then, it, it, then you, again, can either um, amend them um, to to reach a point where you agree that those are your findings, um, or you if you if you don't believe that that's um, possible, then you don't have to adopt them and, and they to go along with your decision. Form, like as if they were more testimony. Like they they are not. They are not. They are clearly they are not testimony. Right. Okay. Um, and they should not be treated as testimony or as, as uh, new evidence or argument. They're intended to be okay. um, applicant preparing findings for you to adopt um, along with a decision should you choose to. So if you don't choose to, they still inform your discussion because you read them? Yes. So what do they become then? Well, so they're part of your deliberation. Okay. Regarding the findings that have to be adopted but by they're the- they're not testimony? No. They're, they're part of the applicant materials? Yeah. They're, yeah, so, um, yeah. Okay. The, 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 you, you have to adopt findings yeah. um, at the end of the day to support the decision. So these are offered the by ones the- ones in the packet. Right. I, yeah, that's like my what I'm used to for the process, but I this one was new for me. That's right. why I don't understand it very well. Yeah. So, but in, like, if they had had more time, would they have prepared these the same way as, even though they came in later, the same way as they had, prepared the ones in their main packet where they, the planning department had responses or is that never done when it's after the fact? So the, the findings document in the packet, I believe was prepared by the planning department no, taking information from the from the applicants. Yeah, so, so the, the, the findings, the conclusionary findings mm -hmm. uh, in the decision document are prepared by the applicant as their burden of proof. And you'll see we, we 
we tried to clearly delineate applicant's response, mm -hmm. and, then, yeah. um, and then there's language of whether it's the finding, it, whether it's satisfied or not in terms of city concurs or doesn't concur, and city doesn't concur but can meet it with this condition of approval. That's typically what it is. By state law, you have to um, allow conditions of approval to get a development project to a finding of being satisfied if you can get there with that with that condition of approval. Mm -hmm. So we, we went through them and said uh, where we felt our recommendation was to concur with the finding or we would concur if this condition of approval so that the, the 108 dwelling units is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. So the transportation is, you know, they meet the transportation thresholds, but there's a 108 dwelling unit cap and it's not 108 lots, it's 108 dwelling units. So we created that condition for that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The two findings are written by different people. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and, thank and, you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have a we have a, an opportunity in front of us. Um, the council has the opportunity to schedule a public hearing on these ordinances that we've talked about, or to ask for a second reading of the ordinance. And so I'll just get a, a, a sense. Uh, I've I've heard two down here. Adam. Yeah, I'm for a public hearing. Sal. Wendy? Yeah, I really feel like, particularly because we have some um, things that came in later, I mean, just like the, with regards to the flood, the uh, five lots that were on the flood plain that we haven't heard public hearing about. So I feel like that's the right thing for us to do is have one. Thank you, and Zach? 100% agree. Okay, so the city council would like to move forward to schedule a public hearing on ordinances 5065, 5069, and 5070. We will schedule that hearing for July 23rd, 2019 at our regularly scheduled city council meeting, which will be seven o'clock. And then mayor, as a course of business for staff direction, the, the the hanging chad, so to speak, that uh, Councilor Stas has just brought up, is the great way to the um, discussion of the five lots that comes yeah. into play with the hydraulic analysis. The applicant has made a proposal of how they would deal with that by um, removing those five lots from play and putting ten dwelling units along Pinehurst Drive, so doubling the amount there or the condition that the staff has brought in. Is there a certain direction that you would like us to put some work into to bring to you, or do you just wanna see how that plays out at the public hearing level? That's something that we would suggest needs to be resolved as we move through this. Great. I'll open that up to the council. I, I know uh, there were a few directional types of things from Sal. Um, any other to address? Uh, With regards to those five lots specifically? Yeah. I'd kind of like to hear public hearing on it. Uh, I don't know. I, I think I would like to hear public okay. hearing on it. Yeah. See how it plays out. Yeah, exactly. So we can we can draft it in such a way where you have options uh, relative to findings for that. Okay. Okay. After or at that public hearing, when that's over, we can give you direction on that or no? Uh, you, you will have one more meeting for your, um, to meet the deadline, so the August 13th meeting. I'm assuming with the first reading of the ordinances, the decision documents can be amended with the second reading motion, right? Yeah. yeah. So you could close the public hearing on the 23rd, give some direction in terms of findings that you would like to see in the document um, before it comes back to you for a second reading. Great. So staff feels comfortable now where, where we're headed and the preparation for the public hearing. And yeah, it's your choice. We yeah. just wanted to make sure we met the code in terms of the noticing requirements and the deadlines. We need to nestle it in there. And Heather, you and your department, as Wendy indicated, thank you. I mean, so much work and uh, the planning commission. And uh, I think it's very obvious that we need to probably have a joint work session with the planning commission mm -hmm. to talk about some of these things that uh, have uh, come to fruition here in the, the discussion, so absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, you, uh, I, I'm guessing Heather needs to stay there because we have yes. one more. We have one more ordinance. More, unless Jamie wants <laughs> to. Do it. We're only on page 500, Zach. Oh, 500. All right. <laughs> Heather, I don't know what I'm going to do. Somebody for took the cookies. We needed a we needed a oh, carb man. lift. Okay, here we go. I mean, a first reading with possible. 
this. It's your price. Uh, this. Oh, right. Save your call. I, I'm, I'm feeling good. I want to. Okay, first reading with possible second reading of ordinance number 5072. Uh, we will consider uh, the matter of ordinance 5072. Does any councilor object to having the ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, go ahead, uh, David, if you do the first reading of 5072 by title only. This is the first reading of ordinance number 5072, an ordinance amending an existing plan development overlay district to add multiple family residential as an allowable use in the plan development overlay district. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll have Heather uh, make a presentation to us. Yeah, so um, so we went two hours on the other one. We were good on that, <laughs> that estimate. Our team was taking bids on when this meeting would end. <laughs> the, way, the way I wrote, I read your time estimates, it's our fault that it went that long because we asked questions. Someone said midnight, so I could really drag this out or we could get through this. So. <laughs> you, know, you haven't had your 2019 performance review yet. <laughs> I haven't finished watching Pulp Fiction yet. Can you keep going? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is another planned development amendment. So same criteria that we're reviewing this under, and it's the same sort of sandbox in which we're playing. This is a plan development on Southeast Norton Lane, um, the end of it. It's the property that's behind the Comfort Inn and Suites next to the hospital. And this has been on the market for a while and there's interest in it. It's a, uh, it's the underlying zone is C3. Um, and the C3 alone allows commercial uses as well as multifamily uses. That's important for you in terms of this decision making. It has a plan development on it that was established in 1999 and amended in 2006. Same time frame as those other plan developments we were talking about. So it sounds like we locked a lot of stuff in fairly early and then it gets amended as it migrates through the development process. Um, but the first plan development amendment on it um, zoned the site C3 PD. It placed development conditions and limitations on the use of the site. So it looked at design development standards and it looked at the types of uses that could be provided. But it didn't have a specific development plan that was approved. Then in 2006, that, uh, that ordinance was amended by ordinance 4863 to allow senior condominiums, senior apartments, and assisted living facilities. So that hadn't been allowed previously. So someone obviously had come in with a plan to develop those. Um, but that didn't move forward. So in front of you today is another amendment request for this plan development to allow multi, multiple family residential as, a, as an allowed use on this site. Um, all other provisions of the original ordinance as, so the original ordinance and the amended part of the ordinance would move forward, all the design and development standards that were established by that. And there's landscaping requirements, um, architectural requirements, utility requirements that would all come through us and, and be reviewed. So it is reviewed under the same criteria um, that we just talked about in terms of section 17.74.070. Um, I'm not gonna go through that because I'm, I'm gonna assume you're mostly familiar with that by after two hours of discussion. Uh, to let you know, in terms of the multiple family residential dwellings, we do have an existing um, housing needs analysis that was adopted in 2001 that identified the uh, deficit of higher density residential land to support multi-family development. We're still working under that. We, we've been rezoning property into R4 high density residential development, but we still have a deficit of acreage from that original housing needs analysis. And we've just updated that and shown another larger deficit. So we were comfortable as planning staff and recommending allowing um, this request to move forward in terms of the multiple family. They're looking at about 110 to 115 um, Apartment units, this is a developer that's developing right now in the community. They're, what they do is they develop multiple multifamily apartments. They also manage them. They have them throughout this area of Oregon. Um, and they're right now developing the apartment complex off of Evans um, that a lot of people are commenting on because there's, there's dirt moving there and that will be about 120 um, units. Uh, what would be important for you to know about, let's see, I'm gonna skip through this, is that it's um, it's on the transit route, so there's opportunity for transit there. Um, it is, um, 
within neighborhood and general commercial shopping centers, and it's a, within a neighborhood, within an area that has other multifamily developments in it. Um, one of our concerns was that it doesn't have access to a park, so the cl uh, closest part is Airport Park, but to get there, you have to go on Highway 18. Uh, so we don't have a trail system yet there. Um, and Or you'd have to go across Highway 18 and try to figure out how to get to Joe Dancer Park. Um, so we are recommending that uh, a new condition of approval be put into this plan development that if multi multifamily um, projects are developed on this land, that we're going to require area equal to 10% of the site to be used as park space. So not remnant property around the site, but actually aggregated 10% for open space. With the three mile lane area planning process, we are looking at additional residential development in this area, and we are looking at a trail system to connect that residential development to airport park and some other amenities in the future. Uh, in terms of trips, we looked at that and they did a, a traffic impact analysis and it shows that our local street network, as we just discussed, will, can accommodate the trips um, and all the utilities are in place to support it as well. So we did get, in terms of public testimony at the Planning Commission level, we got written testimony from the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. We get that for all of our housing developments to remind us that we need to ensure that the housing we're approving meets our housing needs analysis. This falls right in line with that. They're trying to ensure that there's adequate affordable housing in the community to serve all families. Um, and then uh, we got one um, testimony of support. I don't know if he's still... <laughs> I want to point out that Mark came forward and supported this. <laughs> um, however, he was concerned about the location, and we all are because it, it will it's an island in terms of a multifamily development, but we are looking to do some improved residential planning in that area. So and we need more residential in the community, especially multifamily. So um, at the planning commission level, they uh, their findings were that um, they felt it met the criteria and they approved it to recommend to you for approval. And I believe that's it. Yep. Any questions for Heather? The, Go ahead, Zach. The 10% dedicated to parks, that was a figure you selected because it's commensurate with a available criteria or where did you get the 10%? It's not uh, commensurate with available criteria, but the, the plan developments allow us to look at what the needs are and to develop conditions of approval relative to those needs. So in plan developments, there is a requirement that open space be provided for residential development. Um, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the nexus into 10%, we looked at what other communities are doing in terms of their requirements for multifamily developments and came up with a 10% that way. My hope is that we're actually underway right now with a review for multifamily development as to what are the right standards for some of these site and design review issues, mm -hmm. um, and we'll be able to amend their code so that that's specific in there. So that you'd specifically say 10 or 15? Yeah, or yeah. 50, okay. But the, it was a comparable with other communities. That was the basis for it. And that 10% was in line with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, again, we have the opportunity on this one to have a public hearing. Is there anyone that would be in favor of bringing this to a public hearing? There are very limited testimony that was received. Yeah, have you gotten testimony from anybody other than Mark? Mm -mm. They, well, in the Fair Housing Council, and when they did the neighborhood meeting, uh, only one person showed up. That was Peter Hofstetter, and he was excited to see it happen. Yeah. <laughs> it brings workforce housing to him. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, where we are, I'm, I'll ask for him. Go ahead, Zach. I have nothing. Really? When's the anticipated? Uh, okay. When would they... Start moving forward on this if we voted on it tonight. Um, they this would this would move forward after they're finished their other one. Gotcha. 
this would be their next project. So they're getting, they're actually a great team to work with uh, and, and their team's been working, so their contractor and their architectural engineering team and their management team have been working together as a tight group for many years and they have a fairly good system down. So, um, and they've been great for our team to work with. So they're working through the Evans project, they'll build that out and then they're getting this in the pipeline. So, so a public hearing wouldn't delay anything on their part, really? Mm -hmm. No. Well, let me, uh, uh, wait, crap, can you look and see, <laughs> my binder with. we have a deadline on this project, and I think the public hearing might hinder that. See, if I was Chuck, I would know this off the top of my head. <laughs> Chuck. I know, I gave him the night off. Too nice. Oh, dating complete. Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing any desire. Okay. Go ahead. Let me continue. Look, I think we're under a deadline, though. Date deemed complete, March 22nd. 120 days from that. Oh, from March 22nd? July. April, May, June, July. July 22nd, the next council meeting is July 23rd. Yeah, and I Ooh. would be able to notice the public hearing with the 20 to 30 day window. Okay. Yeah, so we would have to get from the applicant approval for an extension on the deadline. I, so I think where, where we're at then is I'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance 5072 to a second reading. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved by Zach and seconded by Wendy. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And so what we'll do is uh, have our city at, uh, attorney uh, give a second reading by um, of ordinance number 5072 by title only. Can I ask a quick question? Go ahead. What would happen if we asked for public hearing and the applicant said they didn't want to extend it? Do they, does it pass by default or? Without the, without the conditions of approval. Yeah, so they they would have to they have to go. There's a process for it, but the but they have the right to go and and uh, through that process. And I forget what the system it is, but essentially it's Red rendered approved their land use application as presented. So the conditions of approval are not are part aren't part of the decision anymore. Uh, and and we have to refund application fees, and there may be an attorney fee provision in there. I don't recall. Okay. I've never never had one go. Yeah, me either, actually. I feel like the... I support the project, and I have no problem voting on it tonight. I would just like to say, moving forward, I would always like to have the ability to have a public hearing. So that, that also raises a policy question of, do you want us to automatically schedule public hearings for every single one of these matters that comes before you? Because that would streamline the staff process in terms of providing notice and, and we would be able to get that out. If that's the direction that this council is going, it would be better to know that Oops. so that at this very first time you consider it, we could have the public hearing rather than yeah. having to have it come back oh. to you three times. Now, that has not been the tradition in McMinnville for you to have public hearings. It's not automatic in your code, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and so we've been following that code, but if that's the direction council wants to would, go, then we need to know that. Would that save us administrative cost as well? I mean, or cost, what would that, what impact would that just cure out of cure? Oh, we, we didn't calculate that into our fee schedule, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we can figure that stuff out and go through. A, we'll, we'll have a fee update. We're under, with with your direction, we're under uh, direction to bring in a fee update next year in July. And so we could see if it's onerous or not. It's not unusual for the city council to have a public hearing at their level. Um, what I would say is, What's happening now in McMinnville? I haven't seen anything come through, except for this one, actually. <laughs> um, 
I haven't seen a lot of large projects come in that are not hotly contested at the planning commission level. So we're sitting down at the planning commission for two, three months in public hearing process, and we're trying to juggle dead the 120 day clock and trying to get extensions from the applicant so we can get through that process. And so knowing what the intention is at the city council in terms of wanting to have a public hearing and not having a public hearing will help us because we are, you, just like you saw with the last project, we are literally down to the day on these mm. things right now because they are not moving through the public process mm. very quickly. I think my bias would be to default to the public hearing if it doesn't add too much administrative cost and we could streamline. Well, and we can that have this discussion we... at a later time with with the full council here too. Yeah, yeah. Are you guys feeling weird about having just opened the public hearing again for the previous one and not for this one? I think just in general, I appreciate public outreach and engagement and people's voice being heard. So, you know, just from a policy perspective, I'm happy with saying, yes, let's have public hearings on PDAs. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. could, could, could and could we could we have a work session with input from planning and start the dialogue there and and understand the cost and the time yeah and and, and we, we could even look at types of applications that would require a public hearing because you know there's there's different types I don't know if you want all of them to have public hearings some are some are more Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I don't mean to interrupt. We have one more meeting tonight and it's 1130. Yeah. So can we actually just move this part of it Good. forward to a different- so I've, a I've asked for a motion. So moved. Wait, wait, hold uh, on. Oh no, you're doing a second reading. Oh, sorry. I'm doing a second reading. Yeah. That was it. My finger is right there, second reading. <laughs> This is the second reading of ordinance number 5072, an ordinance amending an existing plan development overlay district to add multiple family residential as an allowable use in the plan development overlay district. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt ordinance 5072? So moved. Second. It's been, uh, Wendy has moved and uh, Sal has seconded. I'll ask the city recorder to pull the council. Councilor Garvin. Aye. Councillor Geary. Aye. Councillor Peralta. Aye. Councillor Stassen. Aye. And ordinance 5072 passes unanimously four to zero. Uh, that closes our scheduled agenda. I now open up <laughs> our McMinnville Urban Renewal Agency meeting on this June the 25th, 2019. Um, we're going to have a public hearing for the fiscal year 2019-20, the budget for the McMinnville Urban Renewal Agency. Um, and so <laughs> Marsh has had to sit through this whole thing also. Everybody's a, gone. She's so tired. that's right. She's on She's the tired. clock. <laughs> <laughs> she gets time and a half after a certain time. <laughs> So, Marcia, would you present? Uh... Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this public hearing is similar to the two public hearings we had earlier in the evening for the city in that uh, there is a change in the budget that is coming to you for adoption tonight, and it's an increase in uh, expenditures compared to the budget that was approved by the budget committee. Um, and uh, this, uh, the increases in the budget for 2019-20, again, were uh, projects that were being carried over, basically money that wasn't spent in 1819 that was anticipated that it would be. Uh, some of the funds being carried over are related to the development assistance program, uh, where those funds, I believe it's just the timing of the projects. Um, on that as well, where the funds were available, but of course the, the projects need to move along at a, uh, for the planning department to move forward with that. So um, it's timing, basically, projects being carried forward uh, to uh, the 2019 budget. Thank you. Any questions of, Mar of Marcia on, uh, on this? presentation. So I will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Anyone would like to uh, provide testimony? 
<laughs> hearing none, I will close the public hearing. And so in front of us, we have a resolution number 2019-2, a resolution adopting the budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2019, making appropriations and declaring the tax increment. Um, I will ask for a motion to adopt the fiscal year 2019-20 budget make and to make appropriations and declare the tax increment for the McMinnville Urban Renewal Area. So the motion. A second. Oh. Been moved by Adam, seconded by uh, Sal. Um, resolution number 2019-2, adopting the 2019-20 budget in the amount of 1189000 854 for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2019 to make the appropriations in the amount of 1,148,894 and to certify and to certify to the county uh, assessor a request for the McMinnville urban renewal plan area for the maximum amount of revenue that can be raised by dividing the tax under section 1C, article is that nine of the Oregon Constitution and ORS chapter 457. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying nay. This resolution uh, number 20, 19-2 passes unanimously four to zero. And that takes care of the agenda for our urban renewal. Oh, nope. Oh, uh, a consent agenda is lost in my paper somewhere, but uh, for the minutes of the October 9th, 2018, December 11th, 2018, January 8th, 2019, and the June 11th, 2019 Urban Renewal meeting. Anyone want to take that off? No, you don't. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> and we do close the Urban Renewal meeting. Oh, good Lord. I think this is the latest we've gone, you guys. No, we went since marijuana. One before midnight. Uh, uh, Meetings don't go late. I don't remember that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Big, big, big. Is that it?